discretion. Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On the morning of October 8, 1998, Gary Condit headed into the Capitol building to join his fellow congressmen in the House of Representatives for a vote. Condit likely knew the entire nation was watching that day. For the last several months, Washington, D.C. had been consumed by the news that President Bill Clinton had been sleeping with his young intern, Monica Lewinsky. Clinton was accused of lying under oath about the affair and obstructing justice. And now, finally, the House was ready to decide whether the president should be impeached. Condit was officially a Democrat, like Clinton, but the 50-year-old had built a reputation in Congress for his conservative-leaning views. And when it came to the possibility of impeachment, Condit wasn't going to stick to party lines. Condit, along with 257 other members of the House, would vote that day in favor of an impeachment trial. The American people deserved to know what their president had done. But just a few years later, Gary Condit found himself in the middle of a sex scandal of his own. And this time, he wasn't so committed to openness and honesty. Condit would do everything in his power to avoid the truth about his own affair with a young intern and her mysterious death. This is a one-part episode on the death of D.C. intern Chandra Levy for the 20th anniversary of her May 1st disappearance. We'll cover Chandra's life, her relationship with Congressman Gary Condit, and the mysteries around her death that are still unexplained to this day. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. It was clear the minute that a teenage Chandra Levy set foot inside her California high school in the early 1990s that she was different. While her fellow classmates worried about boyfriends or whose older sibling could buy them beer, the smart, motivated girl with a mane of curly brown hair was already focused on her future. Chandra knew she wanted more from life than what she could find in Modesto, California, the quiet city where she lived with her parents. Modesto in the 90s lived up to its name, which is Spanish for modest. While she was in high school, Chandra began volunteering at the local police department, where she helped out around the office and rode in the passenger seat of squad cars while they made rounds through Modesto. She even got her own Modesto Police Department uniform, complete with a badge. Chandra started wearing the brown button-up shirt and badge to class at Davis High School. Chandra spent a lot of time around the police station and made friends with people in the department, including some of the cops themselves. We don't know the exact details of these friendships, but it's easy to imagine a young Chandra being drawn to these professional, career-driven police officers. She reportedly always liked older men, particularly actor Harrison Ford. In a note during senior year, one of Chandra's friends wrote, Older guys are better. I mean, so what if Harrison Ford is in his mid-50s? We'll probably like younger guys as we get older ourselves. (laughs) Viva older men. After high school, Chandra headed to San Francisco State to earn a major in criminal justice. She also started dating one of the Modesto police officers, a man named Mark, who was nearly 10 years her senior. But once she finished her undergraduate program, Chandra decided that it was time to leave Modesto behind for good. She earned her master's from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where she interned in the mayor's office. Later, she worked for Governor Gray Davis in Sacramento, That eventually led to an internship all the way across the country with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And so, on September 14, 2000, 23-year-old Chandra Levy stepped off an airplane in Washington, D.C. with a prestigious new position and her sights set on a future career with the FBI or the CIA. 
One day that fall, Chandra and an old college friend named Jennifer headed to the Capitol in hopes of meeting someone in Congress who could give them a job. But Chandra got more than that. The pair unexpectedly found themselves face to face with Modesto's own congressman, 52-year-old Gary Condit. And Condit immediately took an interest in the young women. He gave them a tour and offered Jennifer an internship. A few days later, when Chandra stopped by his office to visit her friend, Condit gave her something else, his phone number. At first, the relationship between Chandra and Condit was strictly platonic. Chandra would drop by his office to chat, and the congressman advised her about building a career in D.C. But one night in the fall of 2000, Condit called with an invitation to his condo. That evening, Fling soon evolved into an ongoing affair. Gary Condit was twice Chandra's age and married with children, But that didn't stop him from regularly inviting her to his apartment. The pair would watch TV, order takeout, and reportedly enjoy rubbing each other down with massage oil. Condit's family lived back in California, so he apparently wasn't worried about getting caught. But their relationship rarely extended past the door of his condo, and he still had a lot of rules for Chandra to make sure that they kept their romance secret. When Chandra visited him, she always wore dark sunglasses or a baseball hat. She left her wallet and ID at home, apparently to avoid someone asking to see it and learning her name. Condit even had rules about how she should act in his building. He gave her an alibi to use in case anyone asked what she was doing there. And if anyone got on the elevator with her, she wasn't allowed to get off on his floor. Condit had one final rule that was more important than all the rest. Chandra was forbidden from telling anyone about him. If she did, Condit said, then it would be over. Chandra did as he asked, following every rule. Condit was a successful and powerful political figure, and Chandra seemed to be in awe of him. He may have treated her like another secret fling, but Chandra quickly began to fall in love. And as intelligent as she might have been, she was still innocent enough to believe Condit when he told her he was planning to leave his wife and start a family with her. Until that happened, Chandra was content to keep sneaking around. A few months into the fling, Chandra headed to her aunt's house in Chesapeake City, Maryland for Thanksgiving. She had kept her new relationship a secret from just about everyone in her life. She even lied to Jennifer, the intern at Condit's office. But during the holiday weekend, Chandra finally let it slip to her aunt, Linda Zamsky, that she was seeing someone. My guy and I have been spending a lot of time together when he's not working. He's amazing. I think I'm going to move into his apartment and take care of things. It's in Adams Morgan, one of the nicest neighborhoods in all of D.C. Everything is going so well. He's in his 50s, but I don't mind. I think he looks like Harrison Ford. Chandra wouldn't say his name, but she told Linda one important detail about the mystery man she was seeing. I'm not supposed to say, but he's a congressman. Please don't tell anyone. Just keep it between us, okay? In early 2001, Chandra took another step that showed just how serious she was about Gary Condit. She called her landlord and asked about the possibility of breaking the lease on her current apartment. Apparently, she was planning to move in with her boyfriend. It's unclear exactly what happened next, but only a few weeks later, the landlord heard from Chandra again. She said she wouldn't be moving out after all. But that wasn't the end of Chandra's relationship with Condit. She was still seeing the congressman in April of 2001 when she celebrated her 24th birthday. At the end of the month, Chandra left D.C. to spend Passover in Maryland with her aunt. During the visit, Chandra spilled more secrets. Her boyfriend had bought her a few nice gifts, including plane tickets back to California and a gold bracelet. And before the weekend was over, she decided to tell Linda the man's name. Gary Condit. 
Congressman Gary Condit. A few days later, Chandra said goodbye to her aunt and headed back to D.C. to finish up her internship at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. At the end of April, Chandra left a message on her aunt's machine. Now that her internship had ended, Chandra was at a loss about what to do next. Hi, Linda. This is Chandra. My internship is over. I'm planning on packing my bags in the next week or ten days, heading home for a while. Don't know what I'm going to do this summer, but I have something important to tell you. Call me. She also sent a message to her landlord, telling him she was planning to move back west in early May. I really hate giving up the apartment, but I think I need to be in California for a while to figure out what my next move is. Unfortunately, Chandra Levy never made it back to Modesto. On the morning of May 1st, Chandra Levy woke up in her Washington, D.C. apartment. She sat down at her computer and read the news, then started looking up plane tickets for her trip. She also read a website about hiking trails in Rock Creek Park, D.C.'s nearly 2,000-acre city park, a few miles from her apartment. What happened next is a mystery to this day. But one thing is clear. Chandra Levy was never seen or heard from again. Coming up, Chandra's disappearance throws Congressman Condit into the center of a nationwide scandal. And now, back to the story. Around noon on May 6, 2001, Robert and Susan Levy sat inside their home in Modesto, California, and dialed the number for the Washington, D.C. police. Their daughter, 24-year-old Chandra Levy, was supposed to return home from her internship in D.C. in less than a week, but the young woman had vanished, and her parents were starting to worry. They had repeatedly called Chandra's phone, likely hoping she would answer with an excuse and apology for not staying in touch. Maybe she was just busy with her move back to California. Maybe she was even riding an Amtrak train back west at that very moment, out of cell phone service. But whatever the case, the calls kept going straight to voicemail. It was time to get the police involved. That afternoon, the Metropolitan Police Department drove over to the apartment Chandra was renting during her internship. When they searched the small studio, they found Chandra's packed suitcases, her cell phone, and her driver's license, but no sign of the young woman herself. When one sergeant opened up Chandra's laptop, he made a critical mistake. Somehow, through his own incompetence with technology, the man managed to crash the computer and corrupt its hard drive. With that, the police erased any clues that may have been hiding inside Chandra's computer. This was just the first in a long string of accidents and missteps that would plague the police investigation for years to come. The second came just a few minutes later. Police didn't even bother to check the security cameras in Chandra's apartment building. If they had, they would have uncovered whether Chandra was alone in her apartment and what time she left. Instead, police just searched her home and moved on. By the time investigators finally decided to check the camera, days later, the tapes had been automatically erased. The potential evidence was lost for good. Back in Modesto, Chandra Levy's parents decided that if they wanted answers, they had to find them themselves. First, they opened their daughter's phone bill and scanned through every number on the list. Some they recognized, but there was one number that kept appearing on the bill again and again. They had no idea who it could be. So, the Levy's picked up the phone and dialed. the office of Congressman Gary Condit. We're unable to take your call at this time. If you are a California constituent, please feel free to reach out to Congressman Condit by... Robert Levy didn't know why his missing daughter had repeatedly called Condit's D.C. office over the past few months, but he wanted to find out. So he found the congressman's home number in California and left a message with his wife. 
A little while later, the Levy's phone rang. It was Condit himself. Unfortunately, Condit was far from helpful. The congressman told Robert Levy that he had met Chandra. She had swung by his office a few times, but that was it. Condit didn't mention that he had been in a secret relationship with Chandra for the past few months, or that she regularly snuck over to his D.C. home, or that he had also called Chandra multiple times over the past few days, hoping to get in touch. All he said was that he didn't know where she was, and then he hung up. A few days later, Chandra Levy's parents announced a reward for any information that helped find their daughter. Gary Condit decided to donate $10,000 himself. He said, Chandra is a great person and a good friend. We hope she is found safe and sound. But that was a little weird, especially that he called her a good friend. Police felt like there was more to the congressman's story that he wasn't telling. In addition to the reward money, they had found multiple messages on Chandra's voicemail that sounded a lot like Gary Condit. And he didn't sound like he was calling just another constituent. Sorry, I've been tied up the last few days. Give me a call. Give me a rundown, kind of what your schedule is. Things are looking pretty good for me today. Anyway, bye. When police questioned him, Condit refused to say anything about his relationship with Chandra. Without more to go on, authorities wouldn't go so far as to name the congressman an official suspect in the woman's disappearance, but it all seemed very suspicious, at least until Gary Condit gave them his airtight alibi. On May 1st, 2001, the day of Chandra's disappearance, Gary Condit had been in meetings at the White House. There were plenty of official records that confirmed his movements throughout the entire window when Chandra allegedly went missing. And there was one strong witness who could attest to spending the day with Condit, Vice President Dick Cheney himself. Nevertheless, it didn't take long before someone inside the police department leaked rumors of Condit's close relationship with Chandra to reporters. And once they did, regardless of his involvement... Gary Condit became front-page news. By the end of May, media companies across the country were feverishly speculating about the politician and his missing 24-year-old mistress. As much as the police may have said that Condit was not a suspect, they offered no other explanations for her disappearance and presumed murder. In that vacuum, the papers and cable news channels became solely focused on Gary Condit. One tabloid even ran a baseless story about the pair, claiming that Chandra was, quote, killed in a kinky sex game. But even as the public pressure grew, Gary Condit refused to go into detail about the nature of his relationship with Chandra. Eventually, the Levy family called out the congressman. In an interview, Chandra's mother said... I think he could come out and share what he does know. We would appreciate the help. But it was Chandra's aunt, Linda, who finally brought the relationship between Condit and Chandra to light. On July 6th, a month after the Levies first reported their daughter missing, Linda sat down for an interview with the Washington Post. I asked, how do you get in touch with him if it's so secretive, this relationship? And she said, well, and this is when she came and accidentally said his name to me. She would dial a number, it would play music, and she would leave a message. She said, I would also call the office and they would answer Gary Condit. And that's how his name came out. She goes, oops. She says, you didn't hear that. During the 90-minute interview, Linda finally shared the secret she'd been keeping for her niece since last Thanksgiving. And just a few days later, Gary Condit finally allowed the Metropolitan Police to take a swab of the inside of his cheek for a DNA test. They tested it against some semen they found on a pair of Chandra's underwear. It was a match. Finally, there was definitive proof of their affair. But that was just the beginning. On July 12, 2001, 
Fox News aired an exclusive interview with a flight attendant named Anne Marie Smith. She said she was also sleeping with Gary Condit at the same time he was seeing Chandra Levy. I found some hairs in his bathroom. And you know how girls are. I was very suspicious. And I asked him, whose hairs are these? And he said, well, they're yours. And I said, no, they're not. They're not my hairs. And they were long brown hairs. And I think that was the end of the discussion. And once news broke about Levy's disappearance, Anne said that Condit's lawyer approached her to sign an affidavit, denying that they ever had had an affair. She refused. I think there's a lot more that he knows that he's not telling. I hope he had nothing to do with it. These allegations were another blow to Condit's already battered reputation in politics, but none of it was helping police get closer to actually finding Chandra Levy. In fact, the whole sex scandal seemed more and more like a distraction. There was no actual evidence linking Gary Condit to Chandra Levy's disappearance, and police had never named him an official suspect. But the media fervor around their illicit relationship just continued to grow. Soon, that evolved into calls for Condit's resignation. It got so bad that Condit's lawyer, Abby Lowell, finally snapped during an interview in July. He said, Go take your cameras and your pads and your pencils and try to see if there's someone else out there who might have some information that might actually find this woman, as opposed to prying into the private lives of the Condit's once and for all. Luckily, police had recently uncovered at least one shred of evidence that might point them toward Chandra's whereabouts. An analyst had been able to pull some information from her corrupted laptop. According to her last few internet searches, Chandra Levy might have been headed to Rock Creek Park. So police began scouring the area for any trace of her. Unfortunately, the search would wind up becoming yet another mistake in their struggling investigation. On July 25, 2001, the FBI gathered a team of volunteers to search Rock Creek Park. Throughout the day, dozens of people, police and bloodhounds, scoured the area. They crunched through the wilderness and along the streets that crisscrossed the nearly 2,000-acre park but the group found nothing. They had no idea how close they'd come to finding Chandra Levy's body. Unfortunately, no one had bothered to check the park's smaller hiking trails, only the paved pathways. And so the search party went their separate ways, and the last clear shot at solving Chandra's disappearance left with them. By August of 2001, Chandra Levy's parents were struggling to make it through each day, Their daughter had been missing for three months, and the media seemed more concerned with sensational stories about the affair than actually solving her case. As Susan Levy told Time magazine, We take sleeping pills to get to sleep at night, but during the day we're not on anything. We're not holding up very well. My diet's off, I eat wrong. I'm often sick to my stomach. I'm very sick. It's sheer terror. I want my daughter found alive. I want the truth to come out. Robert and Susan Levy never got their wish. But a year later, they finally found some unfortunate closure when Chandra Levy's skull was discovered in Rock Creek Park. Coming up, a suspect in Chandra Levy's murder emerges nearly a decade after her disappearance. Now, back to the story. Early on Wednesday, May 22, 2002, 44-year-old Philip Palmer walked his dog through Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. As he crunched through the leaves near one of the many hiking trails, his eyes landed on something strange. It was bright white and partially hidden on the forest floor. At first, Palmer couldn't tell what the object was. He moved closer to get a better look, and then all of a sudden it dawned on him. He was staring down at a human skull. 
Palmer ran to call 911. By the afternoon, the area was swarming with police. They uncovered more skeletal remains and scraps of clothing, including a sports bra and a tattered University of Southern California t-shirt. It was Chandra Levy. The body was less than the length of a football field from where dozens of people searched for her a year earlier. But police had somehow determined that the hiking trails weren't worth investigating. According to Washington, D.C. medical examiner Dr. Jonathan Arden, the body was so decomposed that it was impossible to find a cause of death. Whatever forensic evidence may have existed had long disappeared, but one thing was still clear. The circumstances of her disappearance and her body on recovery are indicative that she died through the acts of another person, which is the definition of a homicidal manner of death. This was no accident. Chandra Levy was murdered. One week later, on May 29, 2002, Robert and Susan Levy held a memorial service for their daughter in Modesto, California. They lined the stage of the Center Plaza building with roses and photos of Chandra. A harpist played as over 1,200 mourners filed through the auditorium to pay their respects to the young woman. But one person was not in attendance, Gary Condit. He had refused the calls for his resignation from Congress, including one from the Modesto Bee newspaper, but his political career was over anyway. The California congressman had lost his Democratic primary the March before, as the Levy family said their final goodbyes to their daughter. Condit was finishing his last few months as a politician. He eventually moved to Arizona, where he opened a Baskin-Robbins franchise with his wife. And with Gary Condit out of Washington and Chandra Levy in her final resting place, the investigation into her murder faded away. Over the next few years, Chandra Levy became just another name on a list of D.C. scandals. And the cold case was made an even lower priority in the wake of world events, Only months after her disappearance, the World Trade Center was attacked. All resources were directed to fighting terrorism. And a few weeks after her body was found, a sniper began shooting people around the D.C. area. Chandra's story seemed destined to go unsolved forever. At least until the media decided to take matters into their own hands. In 2007... Six years after Chandra Levy first went missing, two Washington Post editors started discussing the young woman's case. All along, authorities had been so focused on Gary Condit that they may have missed valuable clues pointing towards the real killer. So the editors decided to take a look at Chandra's case once again and hopefully see what the police couldn't. For the next year, the journalists pored over every scrap of evidence, and they eventually uncovered a lead. On July 13, 2008, after a year of reporting, the Washington Post published the first of 13 articles on the D.C. cold case. One article read... While D.C. police focus most of their investigative efforts on Representative Gary Condit and his relationship to missing intern Chandra Levy... They were slow to recognize another lead. It involved a man who was attacking women in the woods of Rock Creek Park. The Washington Post had a suspect. He was an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador named Ingmar Guandique. And it seemed like police had missed a whole string of evidence connecting him to Chandra Levy. Guandique was currently serving 10 years in prison for assaulting two women in Rock Creek Park in the early 2000s, right around the time that Chandra went missing. The then 19-year-old had pounced on two women as they were jogging down hiking trails in Rock Creek, but both had managed to fight him off and escape. And on May 1st, 2001, the day Chandra went missing, Guandique missed work at his construction job. When he reappeared, his face was bruised and scratched. He claimed the wounds were from a fight with an ex-girlfriend, but his facts didn't add up. 
By the time police realized Chandra's murder was related to Rock Creek, Guandique was in prison for the other two jogging attacks. On July 2, 2001, D.C. Park Police brought a photo of Chandra to the prison to ask him what he knew. Have you ever seen this girl before? Once, in the parking lot at Rock Creek Park. Is that right? Well, do you think she's good-looking? Sure, why not? But I never saw her again after that. And for some reason, police left it at that. No one looked at Guandique again until the Washington Post investigation. A few months later, in September of 2001... One of Guandique's old cellmates came forward with a shocking piece of information. Guandique had allegedly told him that he murdered Chandra. But when the informant flunked a polygraph test, the FBI assumed it was a fake tip. And once again, they moved on. But the Washington Post was a little more thorough. Over the course of the reports, the journalist laid out a convincing case that Guandique could have killed Chandra Levy. The articles gave Chandra the investigation that police never did. They were too focused on Gary Condit, who they knew from the beginning couldn't have murdered her. Among other things, investigators cite the failure to immediately obtain the security camera tape from Chandra's apartment building. The failure to promptly and correctly analyze the contents of her computer, which would have shown that she was searching for something to do in Rock Creek Park. The failure to conduct a more rigorous search of Rock Creek Park and the failure to quickly recognize and capitalize on the possible link between Chandra's disappearance and Guandique's Rock Creek Park attacks. The Washington Post story immediately reignited the long dormant investigation. In September of 2008, the D.C. police visited 27-year-old Ingmar Guandique in his cell at a California prison to question him again about Chandra Levy. Guandique denied that he killed her, but the authorities were suspicious about a tattoo on his chest. It was a woman with long black hair, just like Chandra's. And when they searched his prison cell, they found something even stranger. Ingmar Guandique had been saving a magazine photo of Chandra Levy herself. On May 19, 2009, Guandique was indicted for the murder of Chandra Levy. He pleaded not guilty. The star witness for the prosecution was a prison informant named Armando Morales, who had shared a cell with Guandique a few years earlier. According to Morales, Guandique confessed to killing Chandra Levy in 2006. There was no hard evidence, but Morales' story seemed to convince everyone in the jury. And so, on November 22, 2010, Ingmar Guandique was convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping, and attempted robbery. But the mystery of Chandra Levy's murder didn't end there. A few years later, secret recordings emerged of Morales bragging about his gang activity and allegedly lying about Guandique and Chandra Levy. The prosecution star witness didn't seem so trustworthy after all. Guandique was granted a retrial, but without Morales, all the prosecution had was circumstantial evidence. And so, in 2016, the D.C. Attorney's Office released a statement that brought the whole case to pieces once again. Due to recent unforeseen developments, we can no longer prove the murder case against Mr. Guandique beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution dismissed all of the Chandra Levy murder charges against Guandique. In May of 2017, he was handed over to immigration and sent back to his home country of El Salvador. As far as we know, he's still there to this day. With that, Chandra Levy's only suspect disappeared. Her murder investigation ended once and for all. Chandra's parents, Robert and Susan Levy, may never get the answers that they want, but they'll never stop wondering. In a 2016 interview, Susan told ABC News, I want someone to come forward and tell the truth. Someone knows something that I don't know. 
I don't think my daughter would run in the park by herself. I guess I'll always have unanswered questions. But even the truth about Chandra Levy's death wouldn't change the fact that she is gone. It's painful. And you don't heal. Closure is a very bad word. There's no such thing. With everything we've learned about the Chandra Levy case, I think Ingmar Gwandike is most likely her murderer. There may not be hard evidence against him, but his history of attacking women in Rock Creek Park and the photo of Chandra in his prison cell build a strong circumstantial case. I understand where you're coming from, but I am not completely convinced. There are still too many holes in the case against Gwandike, And he has continued to claim that he is innocent. I'm not sure who her killer was, but I believe there's more to the story that sadly may never come to light. In any case, Chandra Levy's name may be forever tied to her brief affair with a politician. But she was more than just another sex scandal in Washington. She was a smart, driven young woman with plans for a future that she never got to live. And her death left a hole in her loved ones that will never fully heal.